16 kilometers west of Pewenco are the cliffs of Monte Hermoso, where Manera often hunts for fossils. In October 1832, Charles Darwin, then aged 23, went fossil hunting here while the Beagle anchored offshore. But when a storm blew up, he became stranded for two days in icy winds with no shelter and little food. He still found some fossils, but nothing to compare with the Megatherium jawbone and one from a smaller ground sloth, Mylodon darwinii, that he found a few miles down the coast. In 1987, Manera showed the place Darwin dubbed Starvation Point to the biologist Richard Keynes, a great-grandson of Darwin's who was preparing a new edition of Darwin's diaries. Darwin said the fossils he discovered down the coast at Punta Alta were almost as important as the Galapagos in developing his theory of evolution. The beach at Punta Alta is now lost beneath naval dockyards, but Starvation Point remains unchanged. I knew Darwin had come here, but I had no idea how important his time in the area around Bahia Blanca and Punta Alta was for his later discoveries and research. So from the moment we came here with Richard Keynes, I became interested in Darwin's life and started to appreciate the importance of his voyage. After we came here, we took him to see the footprints. He later wrote that if Charles Darwin had seen the tracks at Peowin Co, he would have been amazed. Darwin was the first to find fossils at Monte Hermoso, where the rocks date back as much as five million years. But at only 12,000 years old, the siltstone at Peowin Co is extremely fragile. This means the footprints are at risk. It's soft when it's damp, and what's more, when it dries out. As soon as it dries out, it turns to dust. There are two things destroying the footprints. One is erosion caused by the sea, which is inevitable, but the damage caused by cars, combined with the effect of the sea, speeds up the marine erosion. But what's more, especially during the last five or six years, there was a time when people were buying lots of 4 by 4 vehicles. They often come down to the beach to drive around. The worst damage is unwittingly caused by locals trying to earn their living. There are fishermen on both sides of the site. Ones from the village to the east think the fishing is better to the west, and those from the west prefer fishing to the east. So people are constantly going from one side to the other and fishing all the time. But they've got places that they think are better, and it seems the very best place to catch fish is just in front of the footprint site. For years, Manera has been urging the regional assembly to pass a law protecting the site, but the process has been slowed by Argentina's economic and political turmoil. Desperate for action, she has put up signs asking people to steer clear of the footprints, but these have no legal force and are frequently ignored. Ideally, the law would ban vehicles and oblige the local authority to create an alternative route behind the beach. Among Teresa's tactics in the battle to save the footprints are visits to the primary school at Pewen Co. She hopes to encourage the children to tell their parents to stop driving over the footprints. Look at this. There are lots of different footprints here. A fox or a mountain cat that lived 12,000 years ago in Pewin Co. These others are from a bear, not a megatherium. A megatherium isn't a bear, although it looked a bit like one. It's very important that you understand that you are really lucky to live in Pewin Co. for all kinds of reasons. It's a very beautiful place with lots of birds and lots of plants. But it also has something that's unique anywhere in the world, and each of you should be willing to teach everyone else that they mustn't damage it. The beach is a difficult place to work, as footprints can only be examined when the tide is out. So far, volunteers have only explored a tiny part of the three-kilometer site. 
In September 2004, Manera won a Rolex Award for Enterprise, which will give her the resources to uncover the secrets of Pau and Co. We're planning to survey the whole site with GPS, so that as and when we find new tracks, we can gradually build up a map that shows how these animals behaved across the entire area. Studying the footprints of extinct animals is no different from what a forensic detective does with the footprints of a criminal. Footprints measuring almost one meter could only come from an adult megatherium. Forensic work is painstaking, but this is a race against time and tide, and any record of these Macrocania tracks preserves precious evidence. But research itself can sometimes harm the footprints, so Manera also plans to take molds from them. You can easily damage a footprint while excavating, so it's important to make molds that can be studied without having to uncover the tracks and risk breaking them. Teresa has asked Heraclio Ortiz to test a new material for making molds of the footprints. He's taken molds from dinosaur tracks in the deserts of Patagonia, but this will be the first time he's tried working on a damp beach. First, the whole area is brushed clean. Then detergent is sprayed to prevent the mold sticking to the rock. The material they're testing is a liquid latex, and the mold itself is built up with many thin layers. Although the latex is meant to dry quickly, the autumn air is so cold, the team is worried it won't set before the tide comes in. We have to wait for the tide to go out before we can find the footprints, and we then have six hours to work in. After that, the tracks usually get covered up again, which makes things quite difficult, both for research and mold making. We need a substance that cures rapidly and allows us to do everything in one tide. Once there are enough layers of latex, bandages are bonded in to preserve the shape of the footprint. When it reaches the laboratory, it'll be backed by fiberglass, so the form of the print is preserved. 